Live from New York City, it's The Cube at Big Data NYC 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, Mark Logic, and Teradata. Now, here is your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE, our live mobile studio. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. We're here, camped out at the Hilton Times Square. Uh, a lot of action going down at the Javits Center. We're shuttling guests back and forth. Ron Bodkin is here, he's the president of Think Big Analytics, uh, now a Teradata company. First of all, Ron, congratulations on the acquisition and welcome back to theCUBE. Well, thank you, Dave. You know, we're certainly proud of what the whole team was able to accomplish. You know, it's a testament to the great work they've done over the years that, you know, Teradata were so excited about what we were doing at Think Big and saw the opportunity to create, you know, one plus one equals five by integrating us in. Well, you and I met quite some time ago in the early days of the whole Hadoop and big data movement. And, you know, we've always said services is where the rubber meets the road for customer value. Yep. Uh, and the research that we've done shows that nearly half the spending in big data is around services. Um, it's hard. <laughs> but you guys, your job is to simplify that, get to business value faster. So talk a little bit about that business and then I want to get into the acquisition. Absolutely, yeah, so you know, our core business uh, has always been around helping customers get you know, measurable value from their data and taking advantage of the open source big data platforms that really change the game in a number of ways. Uh, but to your point, um, it's been hard for many organizations to adopt these technologies because you know, they, they involve you know, some changes in thinking, right? That we had really mature, well understood ecosystem around data warehousing, integrated data warehousing, you know, ETL, BI, um, and changing that game, you know, say, hey, there's new ways of doing analytics. We can work with data sets at the deep behavioral level. level. Those types of things um, challenge a lot of assumptions and, you know, candidly, over the last 10 years, a lot of organizations had settled into kind of operate and run and more of a, uh, a cost center mentality around IT rather than a partner with the business to drive innovation, right? So a lot of why organizations are sometimes, I think, struggling with adopting big data is because they need a lot of help on putting that creative spark back in and building that partnership between the business and the technology organization. So the work that you were doing, or are doing at Think Big Analytics sort of pre-acquisition, which is still the work that you're doing, yeah. and not, not, not a lot has changed, but, but I wonder if you could describe it specifically in terms of the relationship with the existing data infrastructure, generally and specifically the, the EDW. Absolutely. So, so just to, to highlight the point you made, um, it is important that, you know, as Think Big, a Teradata company, we maintain our vendor neutral independence, right? One of the things that Teradata is excited about is that we can work with customers using all kinds of databases, using, you know, any uh, leading open source technology, right? All the different distributions. So that, you know, our, our stance is we're, we are out there to help the customer, right? And so we're not compensated on the products that Teradata provides, you know, we're not uh, we're, we're not being incented to sell into Teradata as based exclusively, just the opposite. You know, I think it's important our customers told Teradata. No product they, agenda. They, right, they want right. us mm -hmm. to continue to do work with customers that don't use the Teradata warehouse, for example, mm -hmm. which is an important part of maintaining our credibility as a vendor neutral company that has a broad perspective. Mm -hmm. But to your, your original question, you know, it's absolutely true that um, that these new technologies, we've always believed that the real opportunity around open source big data is net new analytics on new data that you couldn't achieve before. You know, we've always felt that the, the business case for rip and replace or you know, cost optimization wasn't that great and there were much more exciting things to do with these technologies, right? So I think the industry has started to come along, right? That the notion of a data reservoir as a place where you can hold uh, a wider variety of data breaking down silos and do things with data that's not in a structured format or as simple a format, you know, to allow connecting a lot of that information, doing deep analytics, being able to enable you to work with raw data in a, quite a comprehensive way, um, has a lot of synergy then with the, uh, the downstream data warehousing world where when you do process and refine the data, you of course need to have the ability to govern it, but ultimately you, you know, continue to have the need to support um, key business decisions around well-governed data sets. The other X factor though that's happening is 
uh, you're starting to see more and more of engaging those larger data sets right into operational analytics, which means things like using machine learning to drive recommendations and next best action and customer interactions, whereas in past the motion had tended to be more people either had really small scale statistical models they trained in a single machine uh, with limited data, or they had humans looking at, at, at data through anal analytic systems and human in the loop modified some rules, right? So you would see that in, you know, prior to uh, being the founding CEO of Think Big, I was uh, at a company called Quantcast and we did uh, innovated around building lookalike models for ads, right? Prior to that, most advertising had been done in a similar way. People manually encoded rules for what ads to target where, and now, of course, the robots have taken over, right? So I think that's th in that industry. And I think that's the trend in a lot of places, more automation of analytics using large-scale data. So that's interesting. Wow, I, I have so many questions about what you just said, but so let me go back to something you said initially, which was, you know, sort of the efficiencies, cost savings is somewhat mundane, there's some, all kinds of other things, like you just mentioned, the ad tech. I mean, bringing you know, an analytic systems and transaction systems together in a way and, and letting machines make decisions that are too fast for humans, you know, repricing yeah. you know, very, yeah. very quickly. That's you know, new forms of business value. But I have, I have to say, I, I'm surprised actually this week at how many interviewees I've talked to, that, you know, guests on theCUBE and others just on social media that are talking about massive cost savings you know, through Hadoop. And my question to you is, is it really cost savings? In other words, they're taking cost out of the business or is it more they're being able to do things that they could not have done cost effective, effectively previously? You know, so, so I think that the most exciting use cases are definitely around doing new things that were cost infeasible, right? That you would never mm -hmm. go in and buy 100 machines, you know, of your it, traditional analytic software uh, to do the calculation, but you now can do that processing in Hadoop, right? That type of th use case. We think that's a lot more exciting, right? As well as just the flexibility to work with da less structured data and have faster iterations and learning out of a large quantity of data, finding the signal and the noise, as you said earlier, right? Mm -hmm. That that ability um, is really where the, the the true value and the transformative effect of big data is, right? The big data effect in the economy is going to come from having more data, driving smarter decisions, and driving to uh, you know faster growth. That's what where the big impact is going to be. There are cost savings, right? Some companies do say, well, look, we want to we take our uh, least favorite um, uh, database vendor up in Redwood Shores, and you know, we want to uh, uh, find a way to use a little bit of less, of less of their software, offload some bloat from those systems and what have you. But usually what we find is that when people try to do that, they discover that it's a little more complex to migrate stuff over from an existing environment, and that the business case isn't nearly as compelling. Right, so that's where we tend to push customers to low-hanging fruit where there's relatively low complexity and high value, and it's usually around data that you haven't been working with very effectively, maybe marrying up a couple of data sets and breaking down silos of information where you know, we see that as a common pattern, right? Maybe in marketing, people are working with data over here in a siloed analytics tool for web, and another one for email, and another one for, uh, for search, right? And so putting some of those data sets together along with the customer profile, suddenly you have integrated analytics that really drives something more compelling. You know, Ron, one of the things we're seeing in the Wikibon community is to see these big data projects popping up all over the place, and in many organizations, nobody's really paying attention to the governance piece of it. Sure. You mentioned governance before. I'm, I'm wondering how much work you're doing there, how, what are you seeing there? We're seeing the emergence of the role of the chief data officer, particularly in financial services, healthcare, mm -hmm. and, and government. Um, what are you seeing there? Is it, a, is it, I know it's a spectrum, but you got the spectrum is kind of, spin it up, see what happens, don't worry about governance, we'll figure it out later, yeah. you know, somebody will, will solve that problem, versus you know, some of the more prescriptive organizations are saying, okay, we're going to put in a chief data officer, we're going to worry about governance, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna set up frameworks to manage data quality. What are you seeing along that spectrum? Oh, it's, a, it's a great question, you know, but I, I want to touch on the first thing you noted about hey, big data projects springing up all over, and I think what, one of the things that, that I think is important is, you know, as we're talking about, hey, these innovative new approaches, high value analytics that, you know, we're rapidly building, think big, with the, uh, the backing of Teradata now behind us. And so, you know, we're aggressively hiring for people that want to work on these exciting innovative projects, so data scientists, data engineers, people working in product R&D for building up some of our capabilities around reusable solution IP that complements and sits on top mm -hmm. of the open source platforms. 
So you know, it's definitely something we'll uh, probably touch on a little bit more later on. Yeah, but I'd like just to come back for those listening, yeah. uh, do uh, do keep us in mind. We're we're aggressively hiring and, and want to hire the top talent to uh, build this next generation of great solutions. Now, you, you asked about governance, and absolutely, I think as organizations are getting more serious about applying big data, and these systems are going into production and are being used to make important decisions, and they're being used to drive operational analytics that are you know, making recommendations or being used to, to automate you know, decisions, it becomes important that you have a level of governance over that data, right? And, and the other thing you see is, uh, I can tell you, even in the early days at QuantCast, you know, we'd find that um, having some, you know, control the metadata over what you're doing in your big data environment is, is really important, right? That, um, in today's parlance, you, 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 there really are two kinds of data lakes as the data, as they grow. You can have, um, one where there's some governance and control and management and data reservoir, or you can have a dumping ground that's a data swamp, yeah. right? And, and a lot of early organizations adopting Hadoop ran into that data swamp trap where if they didn't have tools for tra traceability and understanding the data sets and curation of them, um, you, you would just get this overrun mass of many copies of data, nobody knows what's authoritative, right? I mean, it's like, in the short term, the, the flexibility of not having to have a lot of schema and structure on the data lets you move quickly, but you still need to have a way of knowing what's done and, and taking things from a, an unrefined raw form progressively into a more governed and controlled form, right? So to me, the magic of big data is not, you know, that you don't need governance, it's that you can incrementally govern the data as you apply more structure, right? So you can be agile and start with raw data and have a really smart data scientist figuring out something interesting and it graduates you know, from them into uh, you know, a power analyst, you know, and then eventually gets more into the broader hands of a, a wider community of people who can work with data that's, they, they need more governed, curated data. So what you're saying it's better to have a data swamp than no data at all? Um, th that's a good question. I haven't right. spent a lot of time thinking. I, th I, mean, I think there's, there's better there's better alternatives to either. I think <laughs> I think you need data, and I think you need to have some governance for sure. Yeah. Okay. So you're not advising people. Okay. Just if you can't afford it, just go capture it and figure it out later. That could cause some problems. Maybe you really need to think yeah. about it. And there's good practice around you know some lightweight um, metadata management annotation of the data so that you can record it, capture it, and and you know know enough about it that you can make sense of it. Right. So. You, you need to at least have some idea of the providence, where data sets came from, right? And then also some notion of ownership of who, who's responsible for this data set anyhow, right? So any data that's in production. I mean, it's fine to have scratch data sets that are in a sandbox that a single you know, individual or small group are working with, but if it's going to be a long-lived asset, if it's going to be regularly put into a data um, lake, then you really want to have enough knowledge about it so you have some accountability and, ability and, and predictability around what is this data anyhow. So definitionally, sorry to get esoteric, but, but the difference between the data swamp and the data lake is sort of the metadata, the rules around the metadata, some level of governance, or, and, and I would think the ability to scale that as your data scales. And, and if you have that, then it's not a swamp. That's right. So you have some, you have, the, that's quite right, you know, that you have that ability to, to have some basic assertions about the data and have some level of confidence. And you know, depending on what you're doing, sometimes um, having the ability to go, uh, you know, in the ideal, you want to be able to take data that's lightly governed with some basic information about it and increasingly assert more and more things about it so that you can have a, a more curated data set, right, that ultimately ends up with the same level of curation that may well be published into a data warehouse. Right, well, you have to refine it from lightly governed to really fully understood and carefully versioned, right? So that whole process, you know, you want to be able to do in all those stages of refinement and governing of data in the big data environment. So at four o'clock today, we have our capital markets event, a bunch of Wall Street guys coming in, and we're going to try to help them, them squint through how to play big data, uh, because there aren't a lot of, you know, pure play big data public companies, and so people are wondering, well, how do I actually invest yeah. in big data if I'm not a VC or, you know, um, and when I first met Peter Goldmacher, who was yeah. the Cowan analyst, he put forth the premise that big data practitioners are going to create more value than the supply side, than the vendors. So look there for, for investment angles. So I want to explore that with you a little bit, uh, because we've been talking about solving some hard problems, but the flip side of that is you've got people that are really good at big data, and they're driving new business models. 
Um, what do you think of that premise? And can you think of maybe, even without naming names, just some examples of organizations that, uh, on, the, on the buy side, you know, it, adopters of big data technology that are transforming businesses that sure. are good investments, for example? Yeah, well, um, definitely, I think there's, there's a range, right? That you've, there's been a whole class of uh, new companies, startups, or the, you know, some of them are giant now, but you know, when places like social media or advertising technology or you know, people that are, are using data uh, to, to disrupt value chains and create massive new opportunities, right? But if you look at or organizations like Uber or Airbnb, you, know, you, you say, well, look, they're fundamentally using data in a deep way to drive their business model, to enable their business model. So you, you just don't see an innovative, fast growth company uh, changing a value chain today that doesn't have data science and, and deep use of data is integral to the way they're building value. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to some extent, those are the, the, the poster children, like the, they're, they're obvious because they're new and they're, they're, they're leveraging a lot of Silicon Valley talent to do big data well. But you know, the, the, they're the tip of the iceberg in the sense that there's a lot more of the economy that is, is you know, being done by companies that are more established. Right? And mm -hmm. we see in our customer base innovators in all kinds of industries. We see you know, innovative applications in uh, asset management and in banking and insurance, whether it's really driving deeper understanding of customers and, and being able to better service the customer you know, more effectively. Uh, yeah. provide, you know, uh, reach the customer and provide what they need. Um, you know, we see uh, being, you know, things like claims processing and insurance and being able to be more efficient and intelligent Logistics, about that. Right. Logistics, the retail, right? Absolutely. The, the existing brick and mortar, guys have a huge opportunity. And in high-tech manufacturing, right, as a, a tip of the iceberg, again, for the whole manufacturing sector, right, we see meaningful use cases around large-scale test data sets mm. that couldn't be worked with with traditional systems. Suddenly you can drive faster time to market with better yields and, and you know, uh, innovation, uh, taking time for scarce uh, product engineers and repurposing it from uh, hunting down data sets and doing reactive analysis to innovating on product and being proactive in figuring out what's really going on and advancing the state of the art. And we see it on the customer service side. You know, more and more devices are connected, so Internet of Things, connected devices, using those data sets to drive better service, and strategic understanding like using the data of connected products to inform how to improve those products, where to invest in QA, so data-driven product management. And so those are all areas where you know, we, we see innovative companies um, really using these techniques to create a ton of value. You mentioned Internet of Things. Uh, are you doing work in that area? What are you seeing? I mean, what is it? Or we should be thinking about you know home thermostats. Is it you know GE's industrial internet, IBM's smarter planet? You know, help us squint through IoT. Yeah, well, certainly, um, like like so many uh, trending terms, you know, there's uh, there are many definitions, right? I mean, I think broadly, to me, Internet of Things is about smart connected products, right? So anytime you've got a product that's connected on the internet and then has is running some form of software. To me, that's an interesting Internet of Things application. You know, there are certain cases where people have dumb connected products that just have like a sensor. Uh, I think those are a lot less compelling, frankly, than when you've got smart products that can react in some way and ha are more complex, mm -hmm. right? So that, that does open up quite a range of applications from, you know, industrial applications like turbines and jet engines through to, you know, uh, hardware products that, uh, that Systems vendors, you know, storage and, and, and servers and so forth are, are providing through to, you know, mobile devices, you know, uh, you know your connected uh, watch and fitness units, right? So there's, there's a huge range, you know, items that are more in a business to business context, like uh, having uh, RFID sensors, right? So there's a huge range of them. Now, what we've seen, though, is that the, 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 the first movers have tended to be tech companies that already have high value smart connected products um, where they've already invested in capturing the data and collecting it because usually you, you can only start to get into interesting analytics once you've figured out you want to capture data and you have the ability to capture it, right? Then it starts to get interesting. So when you look at what a lot of people talk about is Internet of Things, which is less around the sort of large value B2B tech product and they think about consumer things, um, you know, th those, are, those applications are a lot more nascent because mostly they're still working on the standards for how to collect the data and, and you know, until you kind of have a, a, a well-established 
infrastructure for collecting data, it's hard to do interesting analytics on it. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think they will be followers. That that kind of Internet of Things analytics will be a follower from the you know the, the starting point, which we've seen to be more these high tech products. Interesting. Let, let's talk about the acquisition. Sure. Um, so, what led to the acquisition? Talk about it from your angle, and if you can, talk about it from Teradata's angle. Absolutely. You know, certainly from our side, uh, we felt that uh, there, there was such an opportunity. Uh, to, to take the innovative kind of projects and work we're doing and, and really blow them up and do it on a much bigger scale and to create a lot more opportunities you know, for people to, to do this amazing kind of work and develop their careers to help more customers be successful, right? We were having to turn customers away because we just didn't have the resources to scale quickly enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we felt that, you know, that, that to uh, climb the stack and add value, there was a lot of investment opportunity to build more reusable components to standardize the best practices and patterns we'd been seeing across customers repeatedly, right? So all of those things, we felt there was such an opportunity to have a big impact and to really drive that key, how do you, how do you help enterprises derive value from big data? How can we really uh, take the leading business and scale it and have a big impact? We felt that you know, there was no partner we could pick that would be better than Teradata with, uh, as a global leader in analytics. And Teradata's always been, you know, prided itself on having uh, industry leading data warehouse technology, deep depth in analytics, and a strong services capability to support customers succeeding on that. So the, the depth of industry knowledge and how to operationalize analytics and how to really be successful um, in analytics uh, was very attractive. Um, you know, from Teradata's standpoint, you know, they, they clearly, uh, we now guys clearly see a ton, a ton of need to integrate these new open source technologies, Hadoop and NoSQL and so forth in with the existing assets, you know, integrated data warehouse from Teradata, um, Aster data, or sorry, Aster for discovery appliance. Um, not supposed to be Aster data, it's just yeah. Aster. Um, oh, well, <laughs> old habits die. I, I, just, I, I just learned that, so <laughs> yeah, it was new for me. But, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the point there being that customers really needed to have that unified data architecture, to have that ability to integrate. Hadoop and NoSQL in mm -hmm. with and streaming, you know, Spark streaming and Storm and so forth into the architectures. And they and they, they had, you know, there's a lot of demand for Teradata to help with that, right? So they had a, a strong desire, we had a strong desire to to really add that capability. You know, and, and Teradata did some work to try to build it themselves uh, prior to acquiring us and, and really struggled. Like, you know, a lot of organizations we've seen there have been very few people who have been able to really succeed at scaling up uh, big data services because uh, there's sort of two options. You know, Teradata wouldn't compromise on quality, but they found it really hard to build a large enough team, right? They, they, as fast, they, they were growing their team, but the market demand was vastly outstripping it, right? Because they didn't have the ability to take people the right aptitudes and train them and ramp them up to be successful, which is one of the key reasons they bought us, right? Is that we, we could take people that are interested in big data and teach them what they needed to be successful, working with a team of experienced colleagues. So we had a critical mass of being able to scale and make people successful who were interested in getting into big data. Right, which so is pretty skills neat injection, thing. really. Yeah it's, yeah, it's skills injection. It's yeah. being supported and having those opportunities, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons why it's so unique to work at ThinkBit. So that's one thing that was really important was that ability to ramp up people to, to scale. Right, another was they, they said, look, think big's the, the big data leader, right? There is a pure play really helping in big data services. They felt that we were by far the best. You know, they, at one point in, in discussions, uh, you know, our executive sponsor, Dan Harrington, said to me, how come there's nobody else like you out there, right? So, it, you know, they looked and looked and it's like, you're, we're pretty unique, right? So, um, so that was really important for them. You know, and a third was we had a, an onshore solution center, so a way of, you know, in our Salt Lake City office, South Jordan, we've got uh, great engineers and scientists uh, who can do sustaining engineering. So we, we view that as much better aligned with uh, onshore business. Um, so a great partner, time zone friendly, closer cultural affinity at a modest premium for remote offshore. You know, we've seen that a lot of organizations have struggled trying to make remote offshore models work for this new space where getting business and technology alignment so important and things are moving so fast. So that was an important factor. And then the last was the solution IP we have built up in our R&D team and the patterns we've already seen that we have lined up to, uh, to drive repeatability, right? So the, the software components that we have developed and are developing to accelerate time to value for our customers. So, 
It's interesting what you're saying <coughs> about why aren't there more people like you out there? Well, part of the reason is that people sometimes look down, VCs in particular, look down on services as a business model. It's got, you know, it doesn't have the software marginal economics and everybody wants that. Yep. Um, uh, and, and everybody says, oh, well, it's going to be you know, Accenture, Ernie Young, IBM, Deloitte will own that anyway, and now uh, we don't want to invest in it. But you, you could have raised more outside money. Sure. And you, and you chose not to. Um, talk about that a little bit. I mean, this is the big data is a little bubblicious right now, uh, but you chose to, to exit at this point versus raising more money. Talk yeah, about the reason why. I wouldn't call it exit so much as, you know, we felt well, it's an exit though. The, I mean, the come right, on, you sold uh, the company, right? This is liquidity, <laughs> but we're not exiting at all, right? We're, we're doubling down to build the organization inside of yeah, Teradata, cool. right? So, um, you know, we acquired Teradata. <laughs> but yeah, no, seriously, what we did is- Your VC's got to exit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, our investors got to exit. But, but, you know, really for us, it was about, you know, what's the way to have that right impact, right? That we felt that, you know, the, the ability to have access to customers, mm -hmm. to have, you know, the, the level of investment and the synergy with the business uh, was critical because we feel like this is a unique time in the market where you can really do something, we can do something and have a major impact on and accelerate adoption and build, you know, build on what it's, what's a great business, right? So we felt that was a, a great thing in terms of the impact and what we could do versus going out and raising outside money um, which, you know, t typically what we were seeing is uh, there were a little bit of a, a gap. The, the, the first of all is the, uh, the, the market for investing in services is not, uh, not like the, the market for product, as you alluded to. And so services investors, sort of, we, we were in this tween phase where we were growing too fast for their models because you just don't see companies growing 100% a year hmm. in services, right? So they don't know how to, to, to understand and value us. And so we were, we were at this weird stage where you know, we would had to wait till we kind of grew and slowed down our growth to become, <laughs> you know, uh, to fit their models. Which is not models. what you wanted to do, but right? it's not at all what we wanted to do. <laughs> hey, let's slow down so yeah. we can we can fit the model. That didn't make sense to yeah. us, right? Right. So really, more strategic capital. And is it more patient or not necessarily? Uh, you know, I mean, I think I think uh, strategic patience an interesting word, right? <laughs> I mean, we're all really impatient because this market is moving fast, yeah, and right. there's so much opportunity that. You know, we're, uh, we're being drafted by our customers to do more and more, right? So it's an exciting time, right? That, you know, you can't, be, you can't be patient in this space, right? So, I mean, and what, so what you're doing with the, with the funds and money, with the capital is people, right? I mean, really, that's the well, big gate. We're, we're, we're hiring a lot of great people and ramping them up, mm. investing in the training, and we're also ramping up on our, you know, investment in software components to drive repeatability and efficiency. Yeah, you said that before, repeatability IP. All right, Ron, hey, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Great discussion, really appreciate your time. Dave, thank you. It's, uh, we've always enjoyed you know, working with theCUBE and certainly appreciate the chance to be Ditto. here Ditto, we appreciate all the support. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Big Data NYC. Right back. <laughs>